Eagles Entertainment. Hello, Eagles everywhere, and welcome to the Eagles Insider Podcast, presented by Lincoln Financial Group. Eagles Insider Dave Spadaro with you. Anybody ready for some football? I think we're all ready to see Roger Goodell from his basement announcing the first round picks on Thursday night. And yeah, they're going to be boos from your living room or wherever you're watching the draft. Just sit back, enjoy, and appreciate that we've got some NFL football, some real sports to cheer for. In this podcast, we'll hear from Eagles general manager Howie Roseman. The final word before the Eagles get into action with the 21st pick overall. And yes, you will hear Roseman as he says, yeah, the Eagles want impact from that first round pick. And really throughout the draft, they will talk very in depth with their rookies in this virtual offseason program. But before that, uh, let's get you caught up with everything that's happening with the Philadelphia Eagles. A lot of rumors, nothing substantiated. Eagles have cap room. According to OverTheCap.com, they've got $27 plus million in cap room. So if the Eagles want to make some moves, they certainly can. And some prominent veterans out there available on the streets to this moment, nothing to report. In just a bit, we'll hear from Greg Delamitros, the Vice President of Equipment Operations for the Eagles, the Eagles honored by New Era as the NFC's Equipment Staff of the Year for the 2019 season. Congratulations to Greg and his great staff. We'll also hear from some legendary Eagles reporters, Ray Didinger and Merrill Reese, as they talk about how this NFL draft has changed so much over the years. And we've got some draft memories from Eagles players. And they always say that, you know, when you're drafted, it's like the greatest moment of your career. Some of these players have vivid memories of that day, and some of them have memories that aren't so pleasant. But first, let's hear from Roseman, the last word before the 2020 NFL Draft. We've got the last word before the 2020 NFL Draft with Eagles General Manager Howie Roseman. Howie, good day to you. And I'd like to start with your idea of starting a fund to help the COVID-19 recovery. What kind of reaction have you gotten from general managers? The idea here is that everyone contributes to a fund from NFL general managers. Well, Dave, you see what's going on in our community and and it starts with our owner and the generous contributions he's made to our community now twice um, and, you know, this organization, what they've done and the people really all around the National Football League, what they've done in this time of need has been incredible. And I think a lot of it stems from realizing how fortunate we are to keep having these conversations and to be working when so many people are are dealing with other things. And, um, you know, you see it, uh, whether it's Brandon Bean, the GM of the Bills, stepping up. And we have an incredible group of general managers and as competitive as we will be the next few days and trying to execute whatever we're trying to get done for our football teams, as competitive as we are all in trying to win games and beat each other on the field in the fall. We're also a fraternity, and you see it in how everyone came together to do this and uh, contribute to the Draftathon over the weekend, which will be an incredible event. Kudos to you, Howie, for really understanding how important everything is in this world far beyond the NFL in this 2020 NFL draft. Now, let's get to the competitive side of things. I know on Monday, the league had a mock draft. How did that go from your standpoint in terms of logistics and communication and and all the important things? Yeah, it was different. You know, I mean, this is different, Dave. Like, I'm used to sitting with you and and giving you a fist bump and and hanging and and getting and always saying, you know, what did you think? Did you watch that guy after we make a pick? And how excited are you? And so... It's all different, and that was different to start. I thought it was a great idea for us to do the mock draft, and um, we've had a lot of conversations with GMs and and talking about how we're going to do trades, and uh, I think everyone's prepared. Everyone's ready to go and understanding that although this will be different, um, it will be a great distraction for our country and our community. All right, Howie, from a logistics standpoint, you're in your home, Jeffrey is in his home, Doug is in his home, et cetera, Andy White, all the same thing. Do you anticipate that impacting throughout the league, trades or any kind of moves that might be made? 
I don't. I don't anticipate that because a lot of the groundwork's already been laid for those kind of conversations. And then it, it happens on the clock. And, and really, you know, those conversations are happening on the phone anyway. You know, when we make a trade last year, when we traded with the Baltimore Ravens and move up to the 21st pick, you know, we had laid the groundwork prior to the draft and then we're calling, you know, they're not in the same place we are anyway. So, um, you know, again, uh, th- there's no excuses in this process. We've had plenty of time to get our ducks in a row and there's people dealing with far more stringent situations than we are. Howie, what has it been like? What will it be like for these seven rounds and the post-draft p- period by yourself, not surrounded by your group at the NovaCare Complex? Well, you know, Dave, I, I feel like I've been around the draft and, and in the draft process for a long period of time. Um, I've, I feel like uh, I've gotten all the information at my disposal. My, my biggest job is to make decisions, is to gather all the information and make decisions. And I say that um, with full confidence that we'll be able to execute and make decisions. Uh, this isn't the first time we've gone through this process together as a group. And, um, you know, I I have no doubt that we'll be able to execute what our plan is to the extent that we would if we were in the NovaCare Center, uh, the NovaCare Complex. And obviously, you know, for me, the the biggest difference is just having people you care about around like you and your crew and and having the fun. That's a great part of being involved with the team is that team aspect. And in terms of an execution process perspective, I, I don't anticipate any problems in terms of just missing the camaraderie and and the energy that we have when we do this, yeah, I think that'll be the hardest part of it. All right, Howie, let's get to it. Round one is upon us. In general, what kind of feel do you have for picks one through 20? The Eagles, of course, sitting at pick number 21. Do you have a sense at this point of how things are gonna come off the board? You know, I, we do as much research as possible. There will always be a surprise. You know, I said this, I think, last week. When we talked and when we talked to the media in the 20 years that I've been in the draft room, there's only been one draft room that went exact the draft day, then the first round that went like exactly as advertised, exactly as we thought. And so um, there will be some sort of surprise that will come about that will um, push guys down. But, you know, I was just talking to one of my friends who, who's a GM in the league and um, someone I've known a long time. And um, you got to have 21 names. You have 21 names so that you're ready to pick at 21 that, um, you know, if you can't trade back, if you can't move up, if you can't stay in your spot and get a guy that is at your break off where the first round goes that you're comfortable with. And we do have 21 names that, that we'd be excited to put on our football team. And uh, we also got to remember that although the, the 21st picks, it sets the tone and, and it's an incredibly important one for our organization going forward. Um, we also have, seven other picks in this draft that we want to execute with and find starters. And, you know, I was thinking about this morning, the 2016 draft where we didn't have a second round pick and we didn't have a fourth round pick. And I was thinking about now you're four years later and obviously um, Carson and his career and him signing an extension and Isaac in the third round signing an extension and you go in the fifth round and Big V signing that extension with the Lions. And um, then obviously, you know, bringing Jalen back and, uh, so that, that's a draft there where we didn't have a second and fourth round pick. Uh, we had a different off season and four years later, incredibly proud of that draft and that process. And so, you know, I, I plan on looking back four years from now and thinking like this is this is another part of the adversity that uh, we got through as an organization and as a football team and, and being incredibly proud of the 2020 draft class and hopefully leading to, you know, another parade down Broad Street and confetti on our heads again, because that's a good feeling. Howie, last year you selected Andre Dillard after the trade with the Baltimore Ravens with the idea that Andre would have a year to acclimate himself into the NFL. And I wondered, sitting here at pick number 21 first round, do you have that similar mindset that you're going to get a player that you can develop a bit here? Or do you feel like he can be somebody who can come in and help right away? Well, there's two parts of it. You know, we're incredibly fortunate that Andre was there at at the 21st pick and we were able to move up. You just see in all the conversation that you hear around the league about these old linemen and these offensive tackles and how quickly they're going to come off the board. And they're hard to find. And we're excited to have Andre and him to get some experience last year and to now have an offseason where he's already acclimated to Philadelphia and uh, gets an opportunity to go showcase his talent and his ability. So, um, looking back on that pick a year from now, uh, feel even better about it than we did at the time. 
uh, though we were excited about it at the time, obviously. And then you talk about the 21st pick. And, um, you know, I, I think last year it, it was a, a situation that we always talk about, which is that these picks are what's best for the long-term interest of the football team. They're not supposed to be uh, just a short-term pick, but uh, obviously when you you pick a guy and he's the backup left tackle because you have a guy like Jason Peters in front of him, it's a, it's a unique situation. And, um, you know, with everything going on, we, we do expect that um, these guys will have an opportunity to get with our coaches on this virtual training, and we'll try to get them up to speed as quick as possible. But we won't make a pick just based on what they can contribute in 2020, especially with uh, how crazy 2020 has already started. We'll make a pick based on what we think is the best fit for our team as we build the team, Dave. You know, um, I think for us it's important that we build the team that also maximizes the skill set of the player that we select uh, that matches also what we have on the team. And, um, you know, that's what we'll look for. Howie, the offseason to date has been really eventful. I mean, go out and get Darius Slay. You bring in Javon Hargrave. You bring in help for the defense. You retain Nate Sudfeld. Is what has happened to date similar to the blueprint that you all laid out after the loss to the Seahawks in the playoffs and you put everything together? Has it followed the plan or has it taken – some directions that you maybe didn't anticipate? No, it has, you know, and I have a plan that we laid out um, after we got with our coaching staff and our scouts um, in February that basically laid out what we were trying to do. And um, we had anticipated that there may be an opportunity to get a difference maker or two in the free agency or trade market at important positions and uh, to get Hargrave and really solidify our defensive line because we're always going to start up front, Dave. This is who we are and this is what we're going to be. Certainly it's important to me and Coach Peterson um, and Mr. Lurie as we talk about how we build our team that we're strong up front and that we're able to protect the quarterback and get after the quarterback. And, um, you know, getting a guy like Hargrave who's young and is already a tremendous player and we see the arrows still pointing up and then get a guy like Slay who is a Pro Bowl corner and can get you the ball back and get those difference makers in free agency and in the trade market are hard. and. Uh, we had anticipated that we would go into the draft a, and not have a perfect depth chart necessarily, and we were totally comfortable with that and understood that the offseason's long, and just because you don't do something in March doesn't mean you don't do something in April or May or June or July or August or September or October, you know? And uh, that's the kind of the mindset we're taking. Um, we also believe that I know there's been a lot of focus on the offensive side of the ball and, and maybe the lack of action on the offensive side of the ball that – you know, we're already starting ahead of the game. And we talk about the receiver position and the offensive line to start. And, you know, we played in, the, in those last few games and in the playoffs without two of the best offensive linemen in the National Football League. You know, when you talk about Brandon Brooks and uh, Lane Johnson, them coming back, those are huge additions to our football team. Um, you know, we think two of the best players in the league and certainly at their positions. And, and then getting back guys um, that were hurt at the end of the year and Deshaun and, and Alshon, we think those guys are good players. And uh, that's our opinions of those players. We know JJ's going to take a jump. Uh, we know getting him back and getting him healthy. And, and then you saw some of your young receivers step up. So um, I think before we even get into the draft, um, we think just getting those guys back and healthy will be a huge addition to our offense. Howie, I wonder when we're sitting around next week, you and I talking about this draft, what will you consider a success after three days of drafting and then that post-draft period? Yeah, getting as many guys that fit uh, our profile, or our Eagles mentality as possible. You know, guys that we're excited about. You know, we spent a lot of time scouting these guys, looking at these guys, guys that uh, we have a shared vision with with our coaching staff, which you know has really been since Coach Peterson and his staff came, has been part of our of our DNA. Is just making sure that we get a shared vision on guys, and we tell them how we see guys, and then they they come back and tell us how they see it, and um, you know doing whatever we can uh, to help our coaching staff, you know the the guys that are already on our team, um, to get further than we have the last two years. And um, you know I look back at it in the last few drafts and we've gotten a lot of good players on our team uh, that have really added you know I look at you know what a guy like Miles did last year a second round pick who came in and, and it shows what can happen with young players on your football team and, and we need more of that and that's what we're looking for in this draft. 
Howie, I, I wonder, do you have specific positions that you want to address, that you absolutely feel like you have to address in this draft weekend? No, Dave, I, I think that, uh, that that's what leads to some of the mistakes we've made is to go in and say we have to address that, that position. I think what we've done a, a, jo- a good job of with our coaching staff and our personnel staff and our front office staff is um, we've, we've written out a list of contingency plans in case that we're not able to address the, those positions and what we would do otherwise. But, you know, I think that the draft uh, strengths um, – kind of line up with some of the things that we were looking at anyway and so I think naturally we haven't tried to change the board that way but you know I I don't anticipate coming out of this draft disappointed in any way shape or form I think that we're going to get players who are going to help our football team next year our coaching staff is very respect uh, responsive to playing young guys and um, you know when we're allowed to talk to these rookies which is different than the 2011 lockout in that we're allowed to communicate with these guys and have this uh, virtual training, an off-season program where we're helping them with their workouts and we're helping them with the playbook. So, you know, it won't be like we'll we'll end the off-season um, Saturday night once the free agency is done. We still have a lot of work to do, and uh, there's still free agents left on the board. You know, there's still opportunities to improve our team. Howie, you had five draft picks in 2018, five draft picks in 2019. You've got eight of them at this moment for 2020. How important is it to keep that volume of picks? Do you want more? You always want more draft picks, Dave. You know, I think that's important. But at the same time, you've heard me say this, you know, we're not going to try to win the draft. um, So we're not going to try to come out and say, hey, we got 16 picks. And so, you know, that's the best thing. I think that uh, our guys, our coaches, our scouts have done a tremendous job um, talking to players after the draft. You saw it last year. We had undrafted free agents make our team. And, we treat those guys uh, like eighth, ninth, tenth rounders. That those guys are going to be guys that um, we actively recruit and try to bring to Philadelphia, and and hopefully get a lot of guys on our front board that can make our team. And, and so those guys will be like draft picks. You know, I feel that way about the guys we've brought in after the draft the last couple of years. So we'll try to continue that trend as well, Dave. What can you say about the roster? How do you feel about this team as you go into the final final stretch around here before the draft starts? Yeah, I think we got a good football team. You know, that doesn't mean that we can't get better because we can, but I think we got a good football team. You know, when you talk about how, how it starts up front, we have depth on both lines. Um, we have good players there. Obviously, we have a tremendous quarterback. Um, we do feel like we have weapons to surround him with uh, as we sit here. Uh, we got a tremendous uh, group. When you look at the skill position players, we got some guys that we think are some of the top young guys and good veterans to match um, defensively. Um, we're excited about our secondary and the changes we made there. We have some young players at linebackers that we're counting on to step up. And um, I think we can go play a game right now and play at a high level. But um, fortunate for us, we got other opportunities to improve this team. And that's what we'll do over the weekend. Good luck to Howie and the Eagles this weekend. Make sure you're with us on PhiladelphiaEagles.com and our official app as we cover this draft like no one else. Wall-to-wall coverage from our homes, of course. How about the way the draft has changed through the years? You know, it got me to thinking the last couple of weeks here. I've been covering the draft since 1985, and it's changed so much since then. I wondered what it was like before I came around. I talked to two of the legendary Eagles veteran reporters, Ray Didinger and Merrill Reese, both of them in halls of fame, many of them. Ray is in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and Merrill, of course, in the Philadelphia Eagles Hall of Fame, and both of them understand that this draft ain't what it used to be. First up, Ray Dinger. Ray, I'm doing this this piece on the Eagles and the new draft setup, and I just wanted to get some perspective on what it was like in the way old days. So I've been covering the draft since about 85. Right. And, and I, so I remember kind of, I guess that's considered relatively modern era of the NFL draft. What is the first draft that you covered? 70. That was my first, my first year. My first year on the beat was 70. So that was the first year I covered it. And what was the scene at that time? Um, well, at that time they were, um, that was their last year at Franklin field. Uh, so their, their offices were still in the Philadelphia bulletin building. If you can believe that. 
uh, the Eagles at Eagles offices, the whole operation, the coaches' offices, the executive offices, and the ticket offices were on the, were on the first floor of the Bulletin Building at 30th and Market Street. Um, and so the the whole draft thing uh, went down right there, um, right there, right there in our office, pretty much. Uh, it was on the first floor. You know, the Bulletin operation, we were on the third floor, but the Eagles were on the first floor. So it was. Uh, so it was all on the first floor there, and it was on. They had this one room that was kind of like their meeting and conference room with a big long table, uh, and that was where we were. I mean, the whole and when I say the whole press corps, I mean it was nothing like now. I mean, it was, you know, it was like one guy from each newspaper. There was no radio. Uh, there was certainly no TV. Uh, it was just the it was just the half a dozen beat guys sitting around this table, um, with no access to television. You know, nothing, no ESPN, obviously. So uh, we would just sat around this table, and uh, every time the Eagles would, every time there was a pick, you know, Jimmy Gal would come. Jimmy Gal would come in, and he would, uh, you know, write the name on a blackboard. And uh, uh, and then when the Eagles would make a pick, he would come in and he would distribute uh, mimeographed sheets, you know, with with the information, the guy's college information. He would go around and you know, that have one or two mimeographed sheets with the information, and then. Uh, you know, and then then Retzlaff, who was the GM, and uh, Jerry Williams, the coach, would come into the room and sit down and talk to us about it. That was it. I mean that 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 was that was it. And then you know, in '71, when they moved into the vet, it was pretty. You know, we we set up uh, the whole thing was set up in that press lounge. You know, the, behind the press box, uh, and uh, and that was. But it was basically the same thing. It was just Jimmy Gal coming in and putting uh, putting names up on the board, and. Uh, and then when the Eagles would make a pick, uh, the coach and the GM would come in and talk to us. But uh, uh, that was, uh, I mean, that was it. It was pretty bare bones stuff. And Jimmy Gal, who you refer to, was the Eagles media relations director back then called uh, uh, PR director. Yep. And I, I remember him telling me stories that he would, I think he would like help scouts players. Yeah, 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 yeah. He did. He did. <laughs> but see, that's, uh, yeah, but that's, um, that's really what he was at that time. When Jimmy got hired, Jimmy uh, he first got hired as a uh, like almost a secretary. Uh, he was he would take dictation and he almost he, he was almost like a, a secretary. He was almost like a secretary. Uh, and then he then they put him in personnel. So he was actually in personnel for um, he was like helping with paperwork in the office in the personnel department for for a number of years. And then he then he transitioned over to PR. So uh so he did he did work in the personnel department uh early on in his tenure but then but then he moved over into PR and then he you know he and uh he and Jimmy Murray actually when I when I started covering the team in 70 Jimmy Jimmy Gal was the was the PR director and and Jimmy Murray was his assistant Oh man when, when did the draft get big Ray when did it when do you feel like it just turned Um ESPN I guess you know when ESPN um, when ESPN put it on TV and made it uh, you know and made it into a TV show, um, yeah that I think that's what changed everything. Um, you know then then the you know the public never the public never paid much attention to it. I mean when uh, when I, when we would write stories back seventy seventy one seventy two the day after the draft. I mean they would run agate with all the names uh, and we would write. You know, like one story or two stories about the guys, and that was it. Probably, you know, sometimes you didn't even lead the paper. Um, and, you know, sometimes you got the guy on a conference call, telephone conference call, and sometimes you didn't. You know, sometimes, you know, if a guy was from a small college, they might not find him for a day or two. Um, but you usually got the first round pick, and they would, they would, they would have him on a conference call, and everybody would gather around the phone, and you'd ask him questions. Uh, and that was it. But then, you know, once it became a TV show, once ESPN came along and it became, you know, wall to wall coverage, uh, then everything changed because, because you had, you had a lot more access then. we had TV monitors in the, in the room and then you could actually watch the draft unfold in all these other places. So, yeah, I mean, you really felt, you, you really felt connected to it, but before it was just, you know, it was just us sitting in a, in a room by ourselves, just waiting for Jimmy Gal to walk in and hand us a piece of paper. Um, the, fun, the, the funny thing, the funny thing was, I'll, I'll tell you this: there was a funny story in the in the Vermeil years, uh, because the previous regime had traded away all the draft picks. Uh, in those years, like seventy six, seventy you know seventy six, seventy seven, seventy eight, um, you know we would we would go there first thing in the morning, never knowing if the Eagles could do anything. But 
but we'd wind up sitting there all day. I mean, they didn't. There was a one draft where they didn't have a pick till the seventh round. So, so we would just we sat in there all day with not, literally nothing to do. Um, and I remember, I remember one year we we just got so bored that by like noon or one o'clock, um, the writers, the, the group of us were sitting together. We decided we, we would have our own draft. So we uh, we came up with the concept of the all the all time all civilization draft. Uh, and we drew numbers out of a hat and, and for to find a draft order, and then each guy got an opportunity uh, to make his uh, his his draft selection. Uh, and of course, the, you know the podium was set up uh, with the microphone and all, waiting for the. And so so we had the podium all set up there. So we all took turns, and you know we each had like five minutes to make our pick, and then you know in turn each guy would go up and announce who his who his selection was. Um, so that's, I mean, that's kind of how you pass the time. Somehow I just can't see Ralph Bernstein, the legendary Associated Press writer who could fly off the handle with the best of them. I can't see him sitting in a room for hours and hours and hours with nothing, no, nothing to vent about. Um, yeah, we didn't have much choice. You know, Ralph, the thing I remember about Ralph was Ralph was always bugging him to draft more Penn State guys. <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, McC- whether it was Jerry Williams or Mike McCormick or whoever it was that come in, you know, Ralph would say, "Why don't you take so and so from Penn State?" Uh, the the funny thing about our all civilization draft was um, with the, with the sixth overall pick, a guy from the Courier Post named Ray Kelly Jr. Probably a little bit before your time. I don't know if you remember him, but it was Ray Kelly Jr. was the uh, the columnist for the Courier Times. Uh, the, the I'm sorry, the uh, the Courier Post. Walked up there and uh, and said, with the sixth pick in the draft, um, we select Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And um, and his and his comment to follow is, we couldn't believe he was still available. <laughs> 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 and, and all all of us were kicking ourselves because I mean, God, that's, a, that's the perfect, that's the most obvious one, and we all missed him. He got Jesus Christ with the sixth pick. <laughs> <laughs> he stole him. He did. <laughs> who, who knew that? Who knew that Jesus was a sleeper? <laughs> oh, that's great! Great trip down memory lane, Ray. Thank you so much. Oh, no problem. No problem at all. No problem at all. Have a great day. All right, you too, David. See you. Bye bye. During the course of my conversation with Merrill Reese, who is one of my annual, spend a lot of time with him during the draft, guys. We love it doing it together. Well, we talk a lot about the draft, and we talk about what he sees as a successful draft for the Philadelphia Eagles. Merle, tell me, in the past, because of course this year is different than every other year, what it was like for you to, you know, from a reporter's standpoint, to be at wherever it was, the vet, or before the vet, or now Lincoln Financial Field, now the Novacare Complex, for the draft. What was the experience like for you? Oh, it was amazing. It, um, it, it has always been a very, very fascinating day for me. And I always woke up in the morning uh, with, with a real feeling of excitement. And I, I've been going down to cover the, the draft since it was actually held in the old Bolton building. So I remember sitting around there, the Eagles were, but, but you didn't, you didn't have to draft televised. You just sit in a room and wait for somebody to come up and, and, Take a slip of paper and tack a needle, a, a thumbtack on it, and put it up on the board. When did it kind of turn to? Was it was it the idea that television turned the draft into a big time thing? I think it was a combination of things, Dave. I really do. I think it was the growing popularity of the game. I think it went along with football surpassing baseball, really, as our greatest national pastime. Uh, be keep people becoming so in tune with the draft as uh, with college football, following the players throughout the season and visualizing these different players ending up on their team. And Bill Werndell, who has been my spotter for a long time, is one of these draft guys. He's been with our lad. He worked with the original group that did our lads guide to the draft. And I never forget Stan Walters, who was doing color with this at the time, said that Billy thinks the only reason for the season is to determine the order of the draft. <laughs> hey, hey, did you ever nail it? Did you ever nail other than Carson Wentz or did you ever nail a draft pick in the first round for the Eagles going? Oh in? yeah, yeah, I have, 
I really have. Uh, I think the easiest one to nail in recent memory was Donovan McNabb because the Eagles were sitting number two in the draft. We saw the various quarterbacks come in. Uh, they would make them available as they came in. We had the feeling that Andy Reid was not overly fond of Tim Couch, and Donovan was the most sensible pick. So I think that was an easy one to, uh, to pretty much zero in on and get right. But most recently, the drafts, other than Carson Wentz, when you're dealing in that second spot, anywhere back in the draft, it's it's very tough because so many crazy things happen. I mean, one of the one of the interesting things was uh, the draft where they picked Jeremy Macklin in the first round, and there was no way that Jeremy Macklin was supposed to be anywhere near that. And what happened? I don't. That's in the second round. Am I right? The first. Uh, Macklin, Macklin, Jeremy first Macklin. Round. Jeremy yeah, Macklin. First, first round. First. First round. And the only way he was available for them was because the Raiders jumped up where, where they were and picked Darius Haywood Day. So crazy things happen, and then players you never think would be there are available. So uh, that was an intriguing draft. Uh, when they drafted Brandon Graham, uh, there were a lot of people who had hoped that they would take Earl Thomas. But Brandon Graham didn't get off to a great start. He had injuries, and he turned out to be a tremendous first-round draft choice and made probably the biggest play of the, uh, the Super Bowl 52 win. Merrill, back when you covered it, uh, and it was at the Bulletin Building, first of all, what was the first year that you did it? And then how many, how many reporters were there? Boy, that's, that is a good question. Uh, normally, I, I, was doing, I was doing pre- and post-game shows at that time. So we're talking about, uh, we're talking about the, the early 70s. And um, I would go down there, and I would think there were probably 10, maybe maybe 10 reporters uh, covering practice every day. It was really only the writers from the, from the Bulletin, the Daily News, uh, and the Inquirer. Those three would be out there. Uh, there would be uh, two or three television reporters out there to try to get an interview. I would say an average practice session, Dave, had anywhere from six to ten people. And there were no press conferences with the coaches they came out off the field. Um, there were there were nobody who went to an auditorium because there was no auditorium to go to until the Eagles moved to the Novacare site. Uh, but we would actually five or six people would get around Dick Vermeil right after practice. Or or even at the beginning. I can remember us getting around Andy Reid uh, for his post practice comments. But today there are there are conferences scheduled for certain days and times. But there was very much impromptu. And also, early, you could just go over to any assistant coach you wanted to, and we all got close to the assistant coaches, and get an interview, rather uh, with a pencil or a pad and a ballpoint pen or with a tape recorder. And they were, they were fair game, and they were very, very cooperative. It's changed dramatically. Okay, Merrill, so that brings us to 2020. I know that you are feverishly studying the draft here in the last few minutes before the draft. Where do you think the Eagles go early in this draft? I'm not going to be original. Uh, I, I mean, everybody, uh, I would say 98% of us think that wide receiver is the target. There are two philosophies in the draft. You take the best available athlete or you draft the position of need. And I think even if they're standing at 21 the best available athlete, because of the depth in that position, might still be a wide receiver. Now, they may have to move up if they want to get one of the big three, who are considered to be Jerry Judy, C.D. Lamb, and Henry Ruggs. But there are other intriguing names who could be there at 21, and you never know that that name could turn out to be best wide receiver in this draft. You never know. But there's guys like Justin Jefferson. Denzel Mims. There, uh, uh, Galen Rager is a good receiver. Uh, there's a guy you might be able to even get in the second round, uh, Michael Pittman Jr., who's a terrific player who I've watched at Southern Cal. So this, this draft is just loaded with outstanding wide receivers, and I would love to see them get one of them. Merrill, I'm going to miss you. We've had, we've had 30 drafts together. 30 drafts? 
Yeah. Wow. That's right? amazing. That's how many years I've been there. So I've been doing the draft since, well, wait a minute, maybe maybe not quite 30. Let me think about this. Merrill, we have had, I, yes, we've had more than 30. I've been covering the draft since 85. So what wow. does that mean? So it's a 30, this is the 35th year. Oh, my gosh. And, yes. and, and, and several of them we, we, spent, uh, we spent next to each other on the set. So, so and and I can tell you that those were my favorite drafts. They were uh, great. Sitting there at the table with you and the two of us anchoring the draft together. Gosh, you, you want a great draft story? Sure. Uh, the Eagles picked, picked Jake Juan Jarrett. And you and I announced the pick, the safety out of Temple. And you said to me, Merrill, you know Al Golden, the Temple coach, during a break. Give him a call and ask him to come on with us and ask him about Jaquan Jarrett. So I got Al Golden on the call. I had him in my cell phone. And I said, Al, Eagles just picked Jaquan Jarrett in the second round of the draft. And he said to me, they did what? <laughs> <laughs> and then after the break, he came on with us and said all the nice things about his former player. But he couldn't believe it. He said right there, he said he shouldn't be a second round pick. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, he's right. He was right, as it turned out. He was. What, what will your setup be for Thursday through Saturday? Like everybody else, I am, I am sequestered, if you want to use a better word than quarantined, in my house. Um, uh, tomorrow night, uh, I'm going to do a little draft show uh, online on, on WBCB, the station of which I'm managing partner. And uh, we'll go online, and it's, and it's me in my house. And Billy Werndell in his house, and uh, Sean Landetta in his house, uh, looking into a computer. So we're going to we're going to talk draft for that. As far as the actual draft itself, I will be right here in my easy chair, looking at my large screen TV, uh, which is certainly not quite as large as looking at the TV in the Novacare Auditorium. But uh, I'll be right here. And if you need me for any comments, I am otherwise. Not involved, but I will yeah. certainly be watching every move taken in the draft. Well, I think we have to get in touch with each other to keep this tradition going. I can't have Absolutely. a draft without Merrill Reese. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, hopefully they will get one of those those wide receivers, and hopefully the one they get will turn out to be a great one. Now, it, it would not I, – I hate to worry, use the word shocking uh, because it would not really be shocking – if those top three are gone and somebody who they value greatly slips back to them at 21, that would not shock me if they go with a great player. Although I've seen linebacker names and the Eagles never seem to take a linebacker that high. So I don't know if they feel at 21 that the best receivers are gone and that they say at 27 or 28 or even at 35, Get somebody of the same value, they're liable to trade back for extra picks. We never know. There certainly is some intrigue, Merrill. I can't wait to talk to you on Thursday night, and we'll see what the Eagles end up doing. Yep, it'll be interesting, Dave. It's, it's always exciting. I've always called it the single most exciting off-the-field day in sports. And in this strange year, it is a welcome respite to reading about the ravages of this disease. Thanks, Merrill. Take care. Be safe. Thank you, Dave. Draft memory is very important for the Eagles players. It's something that only happens once in a career. And for many Eagles, it's a great day. For some Eagles, not so great. Let's hear from some of those Eagles. First up, Zach Ertz, who clearly remembers every bit of his 2013 draft experience. Can you give me some draft memories? What what was your memory of being selected by the Philadelphia Eagles? Yeah, I mean, the draft memory, I remember it like yesterday. Um, obviously, it was – it was. I've been fortunate enough to be here my whole career. Draft day for me was almost eight years ago, which is freaking incredible. Um, but it, it's a day I'll never forget. You know, Thursday happened. Thursday was the first round of the draft. Um, we thought there was a chance I would go there. Um, but I always knew the Eagles liked me at the time. They had a really good tight end room though, with Brent Selick and James Casey just being signed there. But I played against Chip in college for four years, um, and I met with him at the combine, and he said, "Said to me at the combine, you know, hopefully we'll be talking uh, the day after the draft." So Friday came, 
Um, and the Eagles had a 35th pick, so I knew it was a chance. And then the 35th pick came. I got a call from Howie and Chip, and they were just saying uh, we're excited that I was going to be a Philadelphia Eagle. I had my immediate family there, my trainer, my agent, um, and we were just so ecstatic to see that 215 number pop up. Um, and it was, it was, it, I will never forget it. It was kind of surreal, still thinking back about it. Wide receiver Deshaun Jackson was a second round draft pick in 2008. Boy, did that pick turn into a great one for the Eagles. What was the experience like for number 10? You know, as far as what I remember about draft day, uh, dream come true, man. Uh, had my whole family with me. They actually came out and filmed it. ESPN did. And, uh, you know, it was just one of them days where, you know, you're sitting back and patiently waiting to hear your name be called. And, you know, I remember, you know, thinking I was going first round and, you know, I slipped to the second round and, uh, you know, all my family's like, you know, it's, it's a team that's going to be calling. It's a team that's going to want you. It's a team that, you know, is, is going to be rememberable. And, uh, you know, Philadelphia, what better place to, to go? Had Brian Dawkins, uh, Brian Westbrook, Dominic McNabb, Sante Salmon. Like, it was a lot of dudes that I looked up to that I was able to come and play with. So, you know, I could just remember, you know, all the memories. And, you know, once my name was called, man, it was like, you know, just a pressure reliever. Like, man, it's just, you know, everything was kind of went away. And I'm like, man, now I could go focus on being the best wide receiver I can be. Safety Rodney McLeod has made himself into an outstanding NFL player, but he wasn't highly regarded coming out of college. In fact, McLeod wasn't drafted. He signed with the Rams after the draft, and he still looks back at his draft experience as one that helped fuel a very fine NFL career. How do you remember 2012? Do you remember it fondly around draft time? Do you remember it uh, bitterly? Like, how do you how do you kind of process that? Yeah, um, it's always a, a time of the year. I mean, I never forget uh, because my name was never called, and I think. That's something that uh, got me to to play nine years in this league is constantly just having that chip on my shoulder and always a reminder each year when it comes around. Uh, but, you know, like I tell guys, because I, cause I love the stories of undrafted guys that come in and make a name for themselves, guys like Greg Ward, um, is, you know, don't let th- those times, you know, discourage you. Uh, use it as motivation and, and, and channel it and, and use it as fuel, um, really. But, um, you know, I, I root for, for every guy in the draft, man, because it, it's so hard. And, you know, a lot of these young men work, work you know what I'm saying, countless hours um, just to hear their names called and, and to feel, fulfill their dreams. And so for me, um, I root for every guy that, that's uh, coming out and that's a part of the draft. But, you know, it's only seven rounds and, um, you know, hoping that you're just one of those picks. But if you're not, um, your dreams, they don't end. Um, as long as you have an opportunity, you have a chance. Offensive tackle Lane Johnson was a first-round draft pick in 2013. And yes, being the fourth overall pick, a special moment. Let's go back to 2013. I was watching video this morning of when you got selected fourth overall, the hugs, the kisses, the pure joy you had. You went up onto the stage in new york city and you met commissioner goodell and he gave him a big hug and smiled and every can you go back to that that night and what it meant to you and and how much kind of as you look back what that whole scene was like for you yeah it was just um you know everything's coming to a conclusion you know the whole pre-draft process is very long lingering you have the combine the senior bowl all these interviews and workouts and it just feels you know you're finally with draft day and and you realize that, okay, I'm about to be headed somewhere. So coming in, I really thought I was going to go to Miami. So as they had the third pick, uh, I don't know, the the cameras were on me and Deion Jordan. So we knew one of us was going to get picked. And my agent, Ken Sardoff, was like, well, looks like we're going to Miami. We dabbed up, and then they selected Deion. It's like I knew Philly was coming up, and and I knew that I had a good feel with Stout and uh, and the organization. So – Next thing I know, I'm getting a phone call. I said this before, I couldn't hear anything. It, it was so loud, screaming. Um, I just knew that Philly was selecting me, and, and there it was. Uh, next thing you know, uh, on the stage, um, shaking Goodell's hand, and then, uh, you know, getting in the car to uh, to head to Philly to, the next day. So it was 
it was a whirlwind, man. It happens all so fast, but it, it, it obviously feels good to, to get it all wrapped up because it's a lot, of, a lot of months leading up to that, just pure work. You might know Boston Scott now after the diminutive but rock-solid running back came on strong in 2019. That wasn't the way the league viewed him a few years ago. He lasted until round number six, taken by his hometown team, the New Orleans Saints. And yes, a very pleasant memory for Boston Scott. Boston, the draft of 2018, you were a sixth round pick by the Saints. What was the experience like? It must have been, we talked about it way back when, but now that the draft is Mm -hmm. right around the corner, do you think about it at all, how great that experience was? Yeah, it was a cool experience, man, because it was my birthday weekend, first off. (laughs) So that was my birthday weekend. It it was uh, uh, day three. So it was, uh, I believe that's the day after my birthday. But um, yeah, I just, just left, um, just left a birthday dinner with my family and friends. And it was funny because uh, uh, the girl that I was with at the time, her dad kept saying, he was a big time Saints fan. He just kept on saying, Oh, the Saints gonna get you here. And it's like, it was like second round. I was like, chill out, bro. Like, <laughs> you know, what's up? But uh, yeah, he was like, Saints gonna get them here. Saints gonna get them here. And I I remember I talked to uh my strength and conditioning coach, uh Kurt Hester at Louisiana Tech, you know, about you know my projection and what whatever, whatever. And really the thing that we were focusing on was like, you're gonna get an opportunity somewhere, you just gotta make the most of it. Like getting drafted, all that was kind of like. I want that was that was a dream of mine, but at the end of the day, like just being real, you know, my size and then, you know, one to two years of, you know, being able to be productive, you know, being behind Kenneth Dixon, who went in the fourth round whenever he was drafted. Um, you know, I, the resume wasn't great, you know what I'm saying? So um, you know, just being able to be drafted in the sixth round, it was, it was wild. It was wild. I couldn't, you know, I I got hot because I saw a 504 number and I didn't really know if it was like a family member because I got family in New Orleans. So I didn't know if it was like a family member, like some long lost aunt or uncle that was calling me up or something. But I answered the call. I answered the call and it was uh, it was Sean P and uh, Mick, Mick, Mickey Loomis and uh, all those cats. So, yeah, I mean, it was it was a cool experience, man. It was definitely a dream come true. And finally, on the Seagulls Insider podcast presented by Lincoln Financial Group, congratulations are in order for the Eagles equipment staff. Now, a few years ago, the Eagles gained a recognition league-wide, the Whitey Zimmerman Award co-winner, Greg Delamitros, the Eagles vice president of equipment. Um, So the Eagles now as a group recognized as the new era NFC equipment staff of the year. And it's not just Greg Delamitros, it's Ed Miller, it's Craig Blake, it's Peter Gould, and it's all of the people who help them keep the locker room cleaned up, all squared away, totally organized. Practices run to crisp perfection. Players wearing the right sideline gear in practice, during the preseason, through the regular season, and the playoffs. Delamitros knows what an honor this is. Greg Delamitros, congratulations, the Eagles winning the new era. NFC Equipment Staff of the Year Award. I know it's not just you. Why does it work so well for the Eagles? Well, it's this is a team effort from from Ed to Craig to Pete. We all talk each week. We, we're on the same page of what hats New Era wants us wearing for practice, for, for week one through week 17 into the playoffs. So we're always on the same page. Everybody has a chart. And... We're all looking out, making sure everybody's wearing what we issue because there are different kinds of hats and guys have favorite hats, but we tell them this is what is mandated that we got to wear. So we're, we're on top of that. And that includes the coaching staff and Coach Peterson as well, what, what color visor he wears each week. It would seem like, hey, man, guys, this is what you wear, and nobody pushes back. But I guess there's a lot of pushback at times from – players and coaches it's not as easy as simply saying hey this is what you're going to wear is there a lot of kind of looking after players and coaches to make sure they're doing the right thing it's mainly just uh mainly uh players that we worry about because you know they'll pack in their bag you know on friday or saturday their favorite hat and what they want to wear on the sideline 
but we'll tell them, hey, guys, you know, you got to wear this with this hat. This is what we're supposed to wear. And you explain to the guys, and they're really good about it. Greg, what does this mean to the Eagles, do you think? I mean, I, your job is a very difficult one. Long hours, very laborious. I mean, it's tough. Um, and to be recognized like this, what does it mean? I, it's, it, it's a true honor for, for my staff and I, you know, that, you know, people are watching what how we dress dress the coaches, the staff, the players each week. You know, it's it's an honor that they watch this stuff. Everything's under the microscope. Now, a couple of years ago, you were also named a co-best equipment staff of the league, correct? Can you ex- ex- explain yeah, the was, difference uh, between the awards? Yeah, this was that one was the the NFL the NFL one, the Whitey Zimmerman Award, and it was us and the Kansas City Chiefs that won it that year. So and that that became a nomination from the league and uh, our uh, peers from other teams. And so in, 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 in this instance, it's new era making the pick based on a formula. Do you have the details of what that formula is? Uh, they have a formula. I can uh, uh, Kyle from uh, Kyle can uh, answer that from New Era. He's got his old point point system that he bases off each week and how they rank each team and how many points you lose if a, if you know you get more points if the head coach and a quarterback who get more TV time you know if they're wearing the right stuff. So it's all a calculated formula from New Era. Very cool. Anything I'm missing here? No, everything's okay. pretty simple. All right, man, congratulations. And, and where, how are you going to spend the $50,000 that you will receive as a bonus? We are not <laughs> receiving no $50,000. <laughs> it's a belt that we get. It's uh, like one of those WWE belts as the, as the award. So the I appreciate Brothers. you, dude. All right, dude. Yeah. All right, All right. thanks, Ross. See you, man. And that will do it for this Eagles Insider podcast presented by Lincoln Financial Group. Dave Spadaro, Eagles Insider, with you ready to go for the 2020 NFL Draft. Can't wait to see what the Eagles do. And I honestly tell you, just hours before the draft, I don't really know what the Eagles are going to do at number 21. We're all going to find out together. Everyone, enjoy your 2020 NFL Draft experience. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Thanks so much for joining us here. If you have a moment to drop us a rating or some comments, we always appreciate your feedback. Please do so on the Apple Podcasts. Thanks for joining, everyone. Thanks to Peter Kelly and to Ray Doyle for their work. Everyone, have yourselves a great Eagles day and fly, Eagles, fly. E-A-G-L-E.